messages that end up in my inbox. The most popular question asked by our customers and prospects by far is what is the power amplifier that we would recommend to partner up with the Sibelius loudspeakers? And in a way you could say, okay, that, that's a pretty straightforward question. You know, any high quality amplifier with at least six or eight watts or more per channel will do, depending on the size of the room. But that's not really a sufficient answer because our clients are looking for that magic. They're looking for the perfect combination. And you can imagine we've spent a very, very long time during the development processing matching amplifiers and trying to match them when we've got a few different amplifiers here, which I will talk about in more detail later on. And of course, we do have our favorites. But so what I've decided to do is to make this little video to illustrate my thoughts on amplifiers. We're going to go into a lot of detail onto the different types of amplifier, the different classes, A, A, B, push, pull, D, e, G, we're not going to talk much about because there's no real common agreement or standard really for class G. It's still interpreted differently by different manufacturers. So we're going to stick with class A, A, B and D, which are the, the main ones for hi-fi for this talk. And then I want to go into the details of how they work. What is the difference? What's the difference between them? Um, and what is the impact on the sound of the loudspeaker? And depending what kind of music you listen to, what kind of room you're in, which one you might be leaning towards. One valve amplifiers can be fantastic in the winter. In the summer, if your room gets quite warm and you haven't got air conditioning, and who would want air conditioning on in a listening room because it's far too noisy and not good for the world's resources anyway, you might want to, in the summer, switch from a valve amplifier into a class D amplifier or or a solid state amplifier because the, the, the valve or tube amplifiers are, the, well, each of these tubes have got heaters in. So you can imagine they're giving off a lot of heat, which you don't want in your listening room. So we're going to go into a number of different topics. I'm even going to touch on acoustics at some point um, because once you've got your amplifier and loudspeaker combination exactly where you want it, when you found an amplifier that really satisfies you acoustically and you can live with its looks and its quirks and designs or whatever, then really you should be able to keep that for the rest of your life. You know, you should be able to hand that down to your children if it's a good quality one. That's the, the powerhouse. It's your bass and drums in a rock band. It's, 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 it's the, the main section. Sure, you might want to change later on your DAC or your streaming device or even the cartridge or the, or the stylus or the pickup arm or whatever at the front end. But the, the power amplifier or amplifier loudspeaker combination should remain solid. So I'm going to talk about that also. And we're going to talk about even the cables that we used between the power amplifier and the loudspeaker. And I'm going to talk about how the loudspeakers work. I mean, how a loudspeaker works and what does the amplifier actually have to do? And why is that combination with the Sibelius SG and the amplifier so specific? But let's go back to the beginning. And my, my first answer to my customers is any high quality amplifier with more than six watts per channel will be fine. Now, obviously that's not enough. But if we go back into the 1950s, there was an amplifier designer called Peter Walker, and he set up and established a company which is very famous in the UK and probably the world over, and it's called Quad, Q-U-A-D. And Peter Walker famously said, if you do a blind test the, and the public and you put your amplifiers behind a curtain, even the most discerning listeners should not be able to tell the difference between one type of power amplifier and another if they're both of a high quality. 
Now, although I have amazing respect for Peter Walker and I love his products, I will show you some of our quad classic stuff that we have in the other listening room, in the white listening room. Um, the only thing I can agree with in that sentence is the word should. You shouldn't be able to. But of course you can, especially today, because there are so many different types of amplifier. For example, if I was to give you an analogy, imagine you have in a car, you have a petrol engine and you have a diesel engine. Now I know diesel engines have advanced a lot in the last decades or so, but fundamentally petrol engines were typically higher revving, they had all their power in the top ends, they were quiet, they didn't vibrate very much, and diesels were noisy, they juddered around a lot, they had a lot of power and torque in the low revs, and they were really good for pushing heavy weights up hills. Now that crude combination you can say well you know what's that to do with it? Well the point is if you're sitting in the back of a limousine driving off somewhere you shouldn't really be able to tell whether it's a diesel engine taking you there or whether it's actually a petrol engine. But of course, if you're the driver and if you're really in tune with the vehicle and you want to do things with it and you want to explore it, yes, you'll be very aware of exactly what kind of engine it is. So you might say, well, for what I want, I really want a petrol engine. But there's so many different kinds. You've got four cylinders, you've got a straight six, you've got a V6, V8, you have double overhead cam, you have 32 valves, 16 valves, side valves. I mean, all kinds of engine combinations. And each manufacturer is going to say, well, this one is better than that one because. So let's get back to the amplifiers and this analogy. So fundamentally, we've got three classes. Class A, class AB, or sometimes referred to as push-pull, and class D. Now, let's start with class A. I really, really like class A amplifiers. I like tube class A amplifiers, solid-state class A amplifiers, as long as they're really well made. But how can we know if an amplifier, regardless of its class, is well made. I have three criteria for this. The first criteria is that the electronic circuit itself should be very well designed. So each of the components should be in balance. Not one component in the whole circuit should be under stress loads when it's not needed to be. The design, the layout, whether you've got a as few as possible components or as lots and lots of components, that doesn't matter. It's actually the quality and the heritage of that design. So for example, if you take a, a name amplifier, for example, name have done nothing but make amplifiers. That's what they do day in, day out. If you're buying a new name amplifier or one of the classic ones, you can probably be very sure that it's going to be good because yeah, that's what they do. They make amplifiers. But of course, there are so many different types of quality. So the quality isn't just the layout, the design, the features like Hegel have in their H90, some very specific architectural topology in their design. Um, it's not just about that. Actually, it's also about the design of the cabinet and the way that the circuit boards or the, or the, or the, the components are laid out so that they're not overheating with each other, that the, the ventilation is cool. You don't want a, a blast of fans going on in your listening room. So it's all got to be in balance. The design's got to be very well thought through and a thorough design. So that's my first criteria, the architectural, the electronic schematic design and the complete design, including the case and everything, has got to be really good. The second one is the quality of the components have got to be really, really good. There's no point having a really great design if the component quality is not up to it. And I want to expand on that a little bit because there is a trend of people going out and buying classic amplifiers from the 70s and 80s. You know, and as I said myself, I've got one next door. I've got a quad 405. It looks like a 405, 
And if you open it, you'll find it's a 405, but all the components have been re renewed and replaced and upgraded because in the old days, the quality of components wasn't anywhere near where it has got to today. Um, just take a simple capacitor, for example. A capacitor in the old days it had oil in it, often were oil filled. And over the years, the oil leaks or the capacitor just breaks down and it doesn't even function anymore. And a, a non-functioning or malfunctioning amplifier can do an enormous damage to your loudspeakers. So if you are going out to eBay and you're going to buy secondhand an amplifier, for goodness sake, don't just bring it back and plug it into your Sibelius loudspeakers because you might do a lot of damage. First of all, take it to an electronics expert, let them put it on the bench, let them hook it up to an oscilloscope, let them put uh, some sine waves through it or all the different frequencies and white noise and see really what's happening. The other thing they've got to do is check all the switches and, um, and the volume controls because these things can also make thumps and clicks and bumps which can really damage a pair of loudspeakers, especially if it's a powerful amplifier. Now, if you haven't got an electronics expert nearby, then get your hands on a very cheap pair of two or three way loudspeakers. Maybe you've got a pair hanging around somewhere or go to a second hand shop. Don't pay more than, you know, 10 euros for them or whatever. But then plug your amplifier into those. And before you put a sound source through it, just switch it on, power it up and just see what's happening. Turn the volume control. Are the drive cones moving in and out or are they completely stationary? Is it making a lot of noise? When you switch the, the switches, uh, is it thumping and crashing? And if it isn't, then fine. Then put a source through it and just make sure it's fine before you connect it up to the Sibelius speakers because that would be crazy if you damaged the, the drive units after all the work that's gone into, into making them. So we need a good circuit design, a good cabinet design, a good construction design. And if you think that the cabinet design, well, that's nonsense. Well, it isn't. I can assure you, if you take the cover off, and I'm not suggesting you do it because it's very dangerous, but if you take the cover off an amplifier and you start tapping some of the components, especially if they're on a, on a circuit board, you will actually find that some of those parts are actually microphonic. So they will actually make a noise. And some of the old and even some of the new, more recent tube amplifiers, some of the valves can be microphonic. So if you've got a valve amplifier, so not all of them, but some of them in your listening room and you're playing your music loud, well, the sound of from, in, from the Sibelius loudspeakers going into your, will be going into the valve itself and actually making a noise. And that's not what you want. So the quality is really, really good. I've got a, a friend in the UK called Mark Manwaring Wright, and he um, imports all the Mingdar uh, tube amplifiers and he modifies them and improves them. And he's built some beautiful monoblocks for, for us. They're fantastic. And, and he knows a thing or two about tube amplifier design. So he's the person that I go to when I want to know, well, what do you think about this valve or that valve or in tubes, or what they call them in the States? But of course, there's, there's companies like Master Sound and Prima Luna. There's loads of different tube designers around and amplifier designers. But you just have to have a trust relationship with someone. And, and if you haven't got that, then start to read the, um, the magazines or reach out to us. Drop us an email. Tell us what, what you're looking for and we'll see if we can help you. So where was I? Yeah, okay, so we have the good circuit design, we have a, a great cabinet, we have the whole thing beautifully made, so it's acoustically good. Uh, we have high quality components. The next thing we need to be sure to make sure it really is a high quality amplifier is the quality of the construction. And here again, I do have a few, well, should we say quirks? Some people say to me, oh, I don't like Chinese stuff or whatever. I'm sorry, but Asia and China, I've seen fantastic stuff coming out of that. I mean, the quality of the soldering and the construction of some of the Chinese equipment 
and the Asian equipment is amazing. You look at it and it's a work of art. Now, I know Gary Morrison's uh, Amplified Designs um, in, from New Zealand, the, the, the Pure Audio, and we'll come to that in more detail later on. They are amazing. I and mean, when you look at them, uh, um, and I'll ask the editor to put some photographs of the inside of his Amplified and it's a beautiful thing. It's like a palace. They're just beautifully made and beautifully constructed. So if you've got a great design from a designer, regardless of where they are, in the States or in the Europe or in Asia, and it's well made and it's well constructed and it's beautifully put together, you should have an amplifier that will last for years and years and years. And then you don't have to worry about that anymore. So let's go back to where I was on the three different types of amplifier. As I say, we have class A. Now, a class A amplifier just means that the sine wave that's produced, the frequency that's produced from the instrument or the voice going in its curve, is amplified in one go by one set of transistors or one tube. If it's a single-ended triode amplifier like the, like a tube amplifier it means that those that tube is actually amplifying in one go the whole frequency now the thing about class a is it really requires lots and lots of energy it's actually on full pelt the whole time so typically you should be multiplying at least by four of the output the amount of power needed just to keep this thing going um, and that isn't necessarily a problem especially if you're using solar panels or whatever I mean we're not talking about a lot of power we're talking about for a, maybe a hundred a 30 watt per channel amplifier we might be talking about 450 watt consumption but that's consuming it all the time it's waiting for signal to come in and zoom, it's going to amplify it in one go. The drawback for some people is that often the power is quite low. At 30 watts is typically quite a big class A amplifier. There are bigger, bigger ones on the market. But shall we just take a little break here to talk about power actually? Because it's really easy to think of amplifier design in terms of power. When you're comparing one design with another or you're choosing, the first thing I know I tend to do it a bit to do is you, you listen, you read a little bit of the review, then you go straight to the technical specifications and say, oh yes, 60 watts, 70 watts, 100 watts per channel. Oh yeah, that 100 watts must be better than 30 watts. Well, no, not necessarily. If we listen to the, 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 the great amplifier designer, Nelson Pass, he will say it's the first watt that's really, really important. And he's absolutely right, and I'll explain it to you. In a normal listening room, maybe 25 square meters or 10 square meters, you know, a small to medium size uh, listening room where you... If you're listening above 87 decibels, that is really, really loud. And I'm going to do a demonstration in a separate video of just how loud that is when you'll see that I'll be talking next to the loudspeaker and we'll build the loudspeakers up from about 55, 60, 70 decibels to 80, 90. And then I'm going to be shouting to, to, for you to hear me on t over uh, the top of the loudspeakers. So, in fact, when I'm listening to music, and I've studied this carefully, you know, most of the time, my amplifiers are having to deliver an eighth of a watt, a quarter of a watt, very rarely half a watt, and sometimes it peaks up to a watt, because imagine it, that 
the Sibelius loudspeaker is 87 dB sensitivity. And people think, well, that's not very high. Well, you've got two in the room. It's actually 90 dB. So at one watt, you're having 90 decibels. At two watts, you're going to have 93 decibels. At four watts, you're going to have 96 decibels. And at 96 decibels, you should be starting to wear ear protection for any length of time. And 99 decibels, well, that just blows, blows your, your head off. And, and if you want to listen to music much louder than that, then don't buy Sibelius loudspeakers because they're not the ones for you. Go and get yourself a big pair of, of three-way speakers or whatever, um, or get yourself a pair of ATC studio monitors. They will punch out, you know, the volume you need because that's very, very loud. So up to eight watts, I mean, really, as long as your amplifier can deliver eight watts really, really well, you're fine, even a watt. Because when an amplifier needs to deliver a crash or a bang on the drums or a heavy note on the piano, for a moment, it needs to deliver a lot of power. So as long as your amplifier is able to react quickly and go up to its maximum wattage, even if it's eight watts, you're going to be fine. I make sound recordings of uh, classical music and classical musicians. And one of our musicians, Avalyn Graham, on one of our recordings, She's playing some Chopin and, and it's really impactful. And, I, I, and I'll ask the editor to just to put a little bit in here just to show you. And in those first notes, bang, if you actually sit in front of the piano and you hear this thing, you're like two meters away from the piano. You feel that, you feel that note hit you. Well, you can get that effect in a small to medium sized living room at just one watt two watts max. So don't get hung up on the on the amount of watts. Also remember that the difference between a 50 watt per channel amplifier and a 100 watt per channel amplifier is only three decibels, you know, and that isn't a lot. So, okay, we've got our class A amplifiers. They are very, very smooth. What I like about class A amplifiers is that you never seem to get tired. If they're well designed, well made, you just, you can just listen forever. The other thing is, don't worry about the distortion figures in a class A amplifier, because typically they might be, have a THD of something like one, uh, 0.1, and you think, wow, that's really high, whereas uh, Bruno Putze's uh, class D amplifier, for example, absolutely amazing, you probably know them from Mola Mola or, or, or Hypex. They might have a distortion of 0 0.0001 or unmeasurable, but don't let that confuse you because on a class A amplifier, if it's distorting, if you're getting harmonic distortion, you're getting second and, and, and uh, harmonic distortions. You're getting that harmonic distortions, which actually sound nice. And there are even some freaks out there who love it because it's actually, it's not an unpleasant sound. So if our class A amplifier, the circuit, the single set are producing the whole wave in one flow, the next class, the class AB amplifiers, which is by far the most common in the marketplace today and probably from the late 60s onwards became, took over from class A to a great extent, and that was because class A, B, or push-pull as it's sometimes called, um, solved a very important and big problem of the time. The big problem of the time was to make a powerful class A amplifiers as I, it was very expensive and it was difficult. So 
what the designers did was they said, OK, the top half of the curve, the positive half of your cycle, because it goes positive, negative, positive, negative. The positive side will be amplified by one set of transistors or one transistor or one tube or set of tubes. And the negative side of the cycle will be amplified by another set, an identical set, but another set. And what they would do was then switch from one to the other, constant switching. Um, in the beginning, it wasn't that successful. And the early transistor amps, apart from the Quad 303, which actually ran for an enormous number of years. I don't know exactly remember how many it was, but it was still in production in the late 80s and it was invented in the late 60s, so at least 20 years. The problem was that when it went from plus to minus, when it switched, you could get some distortion at that point. And that up, and it when an AB amplifier distorts, it doesn't sound nice. It tends to really great and you if you listen to an amplifier on music and it sounds too noisy and it sounds too loud and you always want to turn it down well it it could be a cheap or a malfunctioning ab amplifier having said that some of the, the most amazing amplifiers in the world the most expensive in the world the del agostinos are off are basically push pull amplifier designs and so don't so don't worry about it but just understand that when you're listening to an AB amplifier, you're going to have a lot more power. Maybe you'll have more dynamics. So it's possible. Um, and but you may have the feeling that you're wanting to turn it down and it's not so relaxing. But for some people, you know, the, the class A freaks, they really want that. And other people in the AB, they really want a lot of detail and they want a lot of control in the bass because there's always some kind of compromise between the two, except for when we get to the pure audio design, um, the one or the 100.3 designed by Gary Morrison. As I say, he really has, has nailed it on the head. And we're going to do a separate little review just on that because of all the amplifiers we've ever heard compared with, paired up with a pair of Sibelius loudspeakers, we've not actually heard anything better yet. And it is expensive, you know, it's like nine, ten thousand euros. Um, so it's not cheap, the uh, the one. Um, and it's obviously quite a bit more expensive than the speaker. So it's not in everyone's budget. But there are, you know, amplifiers like the Hegel H90 and others, you know, um, in much lower price, like one and a half, two, three thousand euros. You can get yourself a fantastic amplifier. So don't worry too much about this at this stage. Let's move on to the Class D now. So in our listening room, we've got a Class D here. We have, uh, you can probably just see it underneath here, we've got a single-ended triode tube amplifier, which is 40 watts each, the mono blocks. The Class Ds are 600 watts each. Now, that's a phenomenal amount of power. Now, we can't really recommend them because there is a potential danger of seriously damaging the Sibelius loudspeakers. Now, we've had them for years. We've never had any problems. But imagine that you've hooked up your 600 watt per channel monoblocks, Class D monoblocks from Dennis Deacon's um, D-Sonics. They're amazing. And you can get them online as well. They're not expensive. <laughs> you hook them up and you go away for the weekend and your children... <laughs> decide to have a party and they whack up the volume, well, they could turn your Sibelius loudspeakers inside out, especially if they're playing um, funk or something like that or, or drum and bass or something. So you have to be careful there. So, you know, that's all we're saying. But we use them and they're lovely because a Class D amplifier basically has no distortion. How does it work? It's very simple, really. Um, the design's been around for a very long time, even since from the 50s. But in the 50s, the quality of the components, they just weren't available to really make it work. I think Sinclair brought out 
a class D type amplifier, very low wattage, one watt or something in the late 60s, 70s. But for all intents and purposes, it was really the work of Bruno Putzes, uh, whilst he was at Philips and he developed it later on, he really transformed uh, the quality of a class D amplifier. And it's incredible. He only lives down the road here in Belgium, actually. Um, anyway, so what the class D amplifier does, it works very similar way to those, you know, the little mains adapters that you have that take them, the, 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 your mains voltage, your 220, your 110, if you're in the States, down to your five and a half for your phone. Um, and you put your USB plug in the back. You can get the very thin ones, and what they and they actually bring all that voltage down. And then you get the big fat ones, which would hum and buzz and give off heat. That's the traditional transformer type. Well, the very thin ones are actually like kind of mini class D amplifiers in reverse. And what they're doing is they're switching on and off, thousands and thousands of times a second, and each time they're dropping. But in a class D amplifier, each time it's going up, it's switching, it's going up, on, off, and each time it's bringing it up. But it happens so many times per second that you can't possibly hear that. That's just impossible. I mean, when we look at a, a light bulb, it seems to be on and the, and the light is consistent. And, you know, a 50, a, 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 a 50 hertz. So, you know, anything more than that, we don't see it. So the class D amplifiers are amazing because they can produce an incredible amount of power for a very little amount of power in. Now, they can't produce more than comes in. That's impossible. But actually, they don't get warm. Um, you can run them day and night without any problem at all. And they're very, yeah, as I say, very, very economical with power. And I like them because they're very dynamic. Because it's a 600 watt per channel amplifier, you can imagine that with... Um, an uncompressed CD or a CD where you're really using the full bandwidth of the CD, like I've done with uh, Avalyn Graham's uh, solo CD. Um, I'll send it, put the details of it below so you can, if you like the music that's you hearing in the background, that's from that CD. Um, you can hear it. So when she's playing those first opening notes of the Chopin, bang on that first note, the Class D amplifier can zip up to the requested amount of power instantly whereas you know a, a, a less well-designed amplifier just isn't able to give you that dynamics so if i'm comparing my class a tube amplifiers which i love and in the winter they glow beautifully and they warm the room up and my wife and i can sit and watch a movie or whatever or we listen to some music it's just a lovely experience but it's not a lovely experience in the summer because the room's too hot so then we can switch over to Dennis Deacon's Class D D-Sonic amplifiers. The only thing is the difference in sound is that the Class Ds are very dynamic. So it's, it's always a bit exciting. It's a bit like being in a sports car, you know, and the suspension is a sports suspension. So you feel every bump, you hear everything. And when the crash comes on the cymbal, you hear it. Now, it's great, but sometimes, you know, I don't want that. So actually, I had the luxury of having both. We can just switch from a Class D very quickly over to the tube monoblocks. So that's kind of the difference. Smooth and calm, go for Class A, be it solid state or tube. I like tube. If you want a bit more dynamic and a bit more control and you want that at a reasonable price and you don't want to heat up the whole house, then yeah, AB amplifiers are the solution. And you have loads from Name and Hegel and Morantz and all of those marks. They're all there. There's also the Quad. I love the Quad Artera um, amplifier. That's an amazing. It uses the current dumping. It's a damp dumping, which is like the 405 which I will show you a little clip of. That's a really good amplifier and a very good value for money. It's like, it's, it's like I think it's about 1,800 euros. Now, that sounds like a lot of money, but it's an amplifier you can buy and it partners up very nicely with the Artera 
um, uh, plus uh, preamplifier and CD and everything all involved and streaming. So that's a nice combination for 3,000 euros. You've really, you've probably got the combination. So there's a lot of really good amplifiers. Now, also the integrated amplifiers, I haven't really talked about them much because obviously you're paying a lot of money for the front end built into the integrated amplifier and there's a likelihood you, you would replace an integrated amplifier maybe a little bit more often than you would a power amplifier because of the fact that the front end, if it's got a DAC or streaming in it or whatever, yeah, that tends to change. So I, I tend to go stay away from those a little bit. But have, having said that, the big advantage of integrated amplifiers are uh, that you don't have many cables. Everything's connected inside. And as, again, as long as it's a really good design, so that it has separate power supplies for the different components in it, and it's all nicely shielded and beautifully made, actually you save yourself a fortune in cables. Um, and that allows you to you know, spend that on, on some nice streaming services or whatever. So there we are, we're, we're kind of rounded it. There's just one amplifier I've, I've hinted at before, and that is the, um, the one, the Pure Audio One. I'm going to do a separate review on it because it's a class A amplifier up to 30 watts. And if you need more than that, it will jump to 100, but it, it just switches basically into AB at that point. I'm not quite sure what Gary's got it doing in there. But what it has is it has the absolute smoothness of the tubes. It's a delight to listen to, but exquisite exquisite detail so that for example when you're hearing an acoustic double bass you can hear all the harmonics around it when you're hearing when Avalyn is going down into the lower registers of the piano you hear that when she's hitting one note she's got the pedal sustain pedal open you're hearing all the harmonics building around that now you get that with the other amplifiers too don't get me wrong but somehow the pure audio matched with the Sibelius loudspeaker seems to keep it all under control. And it's just so beautiful to listen to. It's just like a flower opening. It's, it's, it's wonderful. So that's, that's the one that I, you know, if I could only have one amplifier, it would be that. Now, why is the combination of the power amplifier and the Sibelius loudspeaker so important? Well, to answer that question, I really need to explain how the loudspeaker and the amplifier works. So let's just take a live recording. We put a microphone in front of Avalyn's piano and she's playing the piano. Now in the microphone, I'm just gonna oversimplify for a minute. You basically have a diaphragm. It can be a ribbon, it can be a metal plate. And basically it's sitting inside a magnetic field. Now, how is electricity made? Because when the sound of Avalyn's piano comes into the microphone, the plate vibrates and if you imagine there's a, a, a wire a coil behind the plate and the coil is sitting inside a magnet then the moving coil within the magnet is producing electricity now Faraday understood and made the connection between magnetism and electricity We've always known since the beginning of time, humans have known that electricity exists because the lightning comes shooting down and they see it and there's electric fish that can give you an electric shock. But there was not a link between magnetism and electricity and it was finalized by Maxwell, of course. But let's go back to Faraday because he made basically the first electric motor or generator. So if you get a piece of wire, a simple piece of wire, and you move it up and down, in a magnetic field, electricity will flow through the wire. Conversely, if you 
put a wire in a magnetic field and you pass electricity through it, then the wire will move. So when Avalin's hammer hits the string in the piano, the string starts vibrating and the vibrations come through and they go into the microphone. The micro microphone starts vibrating. That little wire is moving in a magnetic field. And a tiny little voltage is going down the cable to the recording device. It's usually amplified a little bit before. And then let's assume that we've, we've captured the recording and it's now on a CD or whatever, or, and we're putting it into our player. That same voltage is then heading off into the power amplifier. And what the power amplifier is doing is it's taking the incoming voltage and it's increasing the voltage by amplifying the voltage and sending it on its way through the cable from the power amplifier to the back of your SG loudspeaker, Sibelius speaker. So why is the relationship between a Sibelius loudspeaker and the power amplifier so important? Well, in most loudspeakers, not all, but most, when the cable comes out of the back of the power amplifier, when the, when the signal comes out of the back of the power amplifier, it goes into the terminal blocks of the loudspeaker and then it goes into a printed circuit board on which there are a number of components like inductors, capacitors, resistors, and they're all formed to split the signal up and to send some of it to the tweeter and some of it to the mid-range and some of it to the bass, so there was some woofer, and, and to try and get them all back into phase again and whatever. So in that process, there is something between the loudspeaker and the power amplifier. With the Sibelius loudspeaker, the wires are connected directly to the terminals on the back, which are connected directly to the loudspeaker itself, to the drive cone. So the wires from the back of your, your, your speaker go through and into the little coil that is sitting inside the magnet in the back of the drive cone of the Sibelius loudspeaker. There is nothing in between, nothing whatsoever. Now, what that means is the loudspeaker is extremely responsive. It captures absolutely everything that you are putting into it. However, if we remember Maxwell's law, when we move the wire in a magnetic field, it produces electricity. So the electricity coming into the back of our, into the coil of our loudspeaker, is forcing the cone to move out. But when the cone returns, of course, it's the coil in the magnet is generating electricity. So the, the, the loudspeaker, which is in fact just a, a microphone in reverse, when it moves back in, is actually producing electricity, which is going back down the cable into the back of your amplifier. And for a perfect matching, a perfect pairing, you want to make sure that your amplifier design is such that it can handle this and most good quality amplifiers can. So we, the, it's one of the terms used for is high damping factor to allow the fact that the, whatever comes back, the, the, the resistance at the back of the amplifier is so low it doesn't see it. And the Class D amplifiers are really good for this. They can handle it really well. The Pure Audio and, and many of the ABs can as well, don't get me wrong. But there's something about the Pure Audio amplifier that really gets this thing under control. My tube amplifiers, my monoblocks, are really, really lovely amplifiers, as I say, but they never have quite as much control as, as, as the pure audio. So just to sum up this little talk, I would just like to say that if you want something smooth and very relaxing and beautiful, then go and get yourself a tube amplifier or a high quality Class A amplifier. That's what I would seriously recommend.
if you like a bit more fire and a bit more dynamics, then seriously consider a modern AB push-pull amplifier. That would be good. You can do that. You can get the same effect in the tube. And I know that, uh, for example, Rogers are bringing out a, a new push-pull amplifier, I hope in August. I've heard it, we've tested it here with Sebaris, and that works really, really well. It's a small push-pull amplifier. Wonderful, it really drove them well. It had it, had it really nicely under control. Um, if on the other hand, you really want purity with loads of fireworks and loads of dynamics, then go for a really, really good Class D amplifier. And, and, and Dennis Deacon's D-Sonics are really good, of course. The Molar Molars are really superb. Be careful because there are some Class D amplifiers in lots of different skins, um, in different cases and different names slapped on the front. The really, really important part of the Class D amplifier is actually the, where, where the signal's coming into the amplifier. And I know that Dennis has done a lot of work on that, especially for, for, for us uh, to really give this uh, lovely, more relaxed effect and not so cold clinical um, effect that some Class D amplifiers can be sort of just boring, to be honest, They're just clinical, something difficult to explain about it. But he's really overcome that, and that's certainly overcome in, in, in the Mola Mola amplifiers, but they are, you know, indeed very expensive. Um, so I hope that you've found this helpful um, and um, good luck with everything. May you choose the right product for you so you don't have to constantly change it or swap it for something else. And after all, what's it all about? It's about enjoying music and bringing those musicians into your listening room to enjoy and appreciate over and over again. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you.